Welcome to the Collecting Keys Real Estate Investing Podcast with your host, Mike DeHaan and Dan Austin. From wins, losses, horror stories, and tactics for optimizing your business, Mike and Dan take a real, uncensored deep dive into the ins and outs of running a full-time real estate investment and wholesaling business. What's going on, guys? On this episode of the Collecting Keys Real Estate Investing Podcast, we have Brad Dumas, who is a small-time real estate investor out of Cleveland, Ohio. I don't accept that term. I think he's killing it. I mean, he is killing it. It was a funny thing. When she says, when you say you're small-time, but you own 24 doors, you know, and a storage unit and some short-term rentals and all sorts of stuff. I mean, that's doing pretty dang well. Like small time, all right. you know, small time, I consider to be like the one or two doors kind of investor. Right. But uh, yeah. he has a really just sort of consistent and valid strategy about how he has grown his portfolio over the last five years, you know, starting with turning his primary residences into rentals and then just consistently buying properties over the years while also balancing that with building a stock portfolio and, you know, remaining more liquid so that, as he said, he's more lendable as he looks at different opportunities. And I feel like it's a great sort of story and viewpoint for many of our listeners because like the reality, this is what most of you want. I understand not everyone wants to try and be Mike and Dan who's out here going through crack houses and doing all this weird stuff. Doing the wild shit. Exactly, yeah. He's living just a great consistent life, building a portfolio and doing some big things. So He's just a good, clean Midwestern boy. <laughs> He's got a W2. By the way, he is a Notre Dame football player. Go Falcons. Look it up. You'll know what I mean. Um, <laughs> I'm not wrong. Please fact check me on that. And uh, anyhow, but like he's just consistent. He has a W-2 job. He's not trying to blow anything out of the water. He's like, hey, if I just buy properties every year, by the time I'm 40, I'll be W-2 optional. So I think that's a really cool part of his story. And that's how I kind of got into real estate. I was like, hey, man, I just buy one a year. I'll be doing great. Mm -hmm. And then I decided I wanted to go, you know, crazy with it. Yeah, exactly. So anyways, hope you guys enjoy the show with Brad Dumas. If you do, or even if you don't, go ahead and leave us a five-star review wherever you listen to your podcast. And if you do want to learn how to find off-market properties, and you know, if you want to be a small-time investor like Brad, but just get better deals, or you want to go big, go and check out the instantinvestorprogram.com and see if you'd be a good fit to work with us. We have a bunch of new things coming out on there. So go and check it out. Anyways, guys, thanks so much and enjoy the show. Brad Dumas from Cleveland, Ohio, ex Notre Dame football player, respects LeBron, but isn't a fan. You know, I don't know. I feel like with Cleveland, it's always super mixed when it comes to that. But it's also like the one thing that everyone associates with Cleveland. So I'm sorry, I immediately LeBran, labeled you Brand James. LeBran, yeah. Are you a Jersey? Are you a Jersey burner or are you a lover? Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, but I, I will say, I've heard he's been good for tourism at least. Well, look, he got us a ring, right? Yeah, right. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. He did. That is true. Oh, and who else do you guys have to claim to fame as Johnny Manziel? What a what a superstar there. What a stud, right? Canadian Football League. <laughs> <laughs> He's killing it now. <laughs> I remember when he was the biggest thing ever back when we were in college. The Johnny Football, man. I, he was huge. I, but you know what? He, where our claim to fame over here is... Ryan Leaf. Yeah. Who, oh, Mike, yeah. You can also claim him. Yeah. And he turned into a great guy as a drug addict mm -hmm. and uh, ex-NFL player. Yeah. What a great... Yeah. Yeah. He went to my high school. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, you got yeah. what do you get popped most recently for stealing steroids from AIDS patients. So yeah. <laughs> that's how you know. <laughs> that's how you know. <laughs> you know you've, yeah. Yeah. Number two in the NFL draft to uh, stealing drugs from AIDS patients. Yeah. Man, rough times. Anyway, Brad. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for hopping on. Um, as you described yourself as you're getting around, you said you are, you think, one of the laziest investors out there, but you've still done pretty well for yourself. You know, you've accumulated 24 doors, mix of short-term and long-term rentals, and you're taking a hybrid approach to investing and creating wealth and passive income, basically using real estate as well as securities and different kinds of stock investments in a way that is, I guess, like comfortable with the sort of lifestyle that you want to live, but also still taking active steps towards getting where you want to be, where you, so you said that you can potentially retire by the age of 40. So I'd love to hear about kind of your background and sort of how you got onto this mindset and how exactly you are continuing to grow and scale without having to work too hard. Yeah, yeah. And Mike and Dan, thanks for having me on the uh, on the podcast. Yeah, sure thing. Yeah, so got into real estate about five years ago or so. Started really small. My first deal ever in Cleveland, Ohio, a $26,000 condo that I was moving mm -hmm. into myself as soon as I... Uh, kind of got into the, my professional workforce. And 
like a lot of investors, the easiest path to buy the next deal was just to move into the next deal and then rent out the previous home. So I did that, you know, three or four times and then moving every year got really annoying. So I started looking at different means to uh, to invest and I started buying small duplexes, fourplexes, fiveplexes, so on and so forth. And uh, now it's just kind of a, a steady growth rate where I'm looking to buy three or four deals a year and uh, not necessarily retire by 40, but be optional w, W2 by 40. Yeah, that's great. I mean, that's great. So you started with not necessarily like the house hacking method, but like the house trading method, right? Where you buy your first right. primary and you can get it with like a better loan because mm-hmm. you're moving into it. It's going to be lower down payment and you know, better interest rate. And then you just basically trade up to, did you like go to like nicer and nicer property or were you just like buying the same kind of property in a different neighborhood or even maybe, I don't know if people even do it like next door because they're just trying to do the whole concept. Almost next door. And all of them were right around like, Fifty to seventy thousand dollars, and you know we, we got them in a time where you know all of those properties doubled, uh, you know, yeah. in the last couple of years wow. with our big run up, and just held on to them. And like you said, good debt, low money down, uh, was able to find quality tenants, and a lot of them still remain in those doors today. And I still pretty much own everything I've I've ever bought. Nice. So did did you have when you're getting into this like a specific buying criteria where you're like, well, if I'm not willing to live there, I'm not going to own it. Or is it like, hey, as long as it's cheap, I'm going to move into it. So my underwriting is the reason why I call myself lazy. I think everyone knows the one percent rule. My criteria was one and a quarter. And if I met the one and a quarter, so one point two five rule, I'd buy it. I, I didn't really spend a ton of time looking through, you know, the the CapEx, which I would do now. But as long as I could paint it, put some new flooring in, spruce it up a little bit, and it could be a home for somebody, I bought it. Nice. Wow. That's awesome. So have you have you now done this with, I was only in five years, how many of the homes that you own have you lived in? Oh, gosh, good question. Five of them. Five of them. All five. Uh, every every, every, every year. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah. It's dedication. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool though. I mean, that's a super smart strategy. So when you were doing that, I mean, even with that that price point of home though, they were all in that same sort of 50, 70. Can you get like normal mortgages on that? Because I know a lot of lenders, they won't do mortgages below say like 50 grand. So are you buying these things cash? You know, my hardest loan I ever did was my first one. That was yeah. $27,000 and yeah. I put four grand down and they had this, this regional bank had a LMI product that as long as the median income in this community was X, they would do the financing for it. So got in my first deal with like four grand, four grand down, you know, that it was a small condo. It's a rental today. It's paid for, but it's worth, you know, 80 now. So mm-hmm. it's, it's one of those nice. things where good, cheap, no money, no money out of pocket debt in the beginning and just did that for a couple of years. And then I, I you know, my next big purchase was a $61,000 single family home that, uh, I put seven grand down on and continue doing that year over year. Yeah. So it's very manageable. You, know? you said the first one's paid off. Now, was that part of just the cash flow paid for? It was cash flowing so well, or do you have a strategy of paying them off? That one cash flowed well. So, you know, so you bought it, I bought it for 27 and I get 850 a month for it. Wow. Same tenant for the last <laughs> man five years. <laughs> Yeah, well, like two point five uh, rule. Yeah, right. Yeah. What, what was your payment even on that? Like seventy three dollars? Like that's outrageous. It was, yeah, it was, <laughs> my mortgage was like one hundred and twenty one bucks, and I had an HOA fee that covered my capex, my water, my sewer, security, yeah. for like two hundred. So I had an all in payment of you know three fifty. Yeah, nice man. Are, are properties still like that in Cleveland that are in like good areas? No, not in good areas. No, not in good areas. Mm. Okay. You can buy in depressed areas for probably under 50 still in some some pockets. But uh, this market, I've never bought a house for appreciation. I've only bought it for cash flow and appreciation has just been the icing on the cake lately. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I've heard that a lot with Midwest investors. Like if you've been doing it in a while, you never plan on appreciation. But the last four or five years have actually been pretty good for Midwestern investors. Very true. Yeah. Yeah. And look, I, I don't have anything to compare it to prior to five, six years ago, because that's when I that's mm-hmm. when I started, but I got in at a decent time, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. You know, but before it got too crazy, uh, yeah, I know we have one of our friends, Drew Ware, he's also in, in GoBundance, and we were met up with him at a meetup last year, and I was talking to him, he invests and buys all in like central Indiana, and he was like, 
dude, this is like, I know we're in a bubble now because central Indiana is appreciating aggressively. <laughs> yeah. He's like, he's been buying wow. it for like 10 years and nothing yeah. has appreciated ever. But now he has houses that were worth like 50% more than they were a couple of years earlier. No, that that's, that's cool though. So you made that the transition out of basically buying primary residences and turn those into rentals. And you started buying stuff just like strictly as rentals. I guess, how did you come around to doing that? Was that mainly just because you were like sick of moving and wanting to scale? And like sort of how did that change your investment criteria if you're no longer looking to live there? Yeah, good, great question. So I certainly got sick of moving, but uh, I just got married this year and my wife, then then girlfriend and fiance, was also sick of moving. So <laughs> we wanted to have a, a primary residence that was you know, nice that we grow into. We want to start a family here soon. And uh, packing up and getting in a moving truck didn't seem appealing every every uh, 12 months, you know? So. Yeah, no kidding. Yeah, so then as you were starting to look for properties, was it the same style of properties? Did you start looking for multifamilies? It eventually got bigger, yeah. So duplexes became a trend maybe in the 2018, 2019 timeframe where we were able to look a little more strategically, like highly dense pockets and neighborhoods, places that had kind of the trendy service industry themes going on. So that's kind of our west suburb neighborhoods in Cleveland here, near the water, a lot of attractions, right? So started buying duplexes and that changed our financing strategy. So, you know, maybe more 25% down type of loans. And instead of doing, you know, one or two a year, we're probably doing two or three a year at that time. My uh, W-2 income allowed me to kind of fight off bigger projects and self-manage probably, you know, a dozen units or so until I hired a manager. Perfect. Yeah. So you find these properties and you said you worked mostly with realtors. Did you have like a key realtor that would be bringing you off-market stuff or were you like spending your evenings like cruising Zillow, cruising the MLS, talking to people? What was your total acquisition strategy to start finding these places? Yeah, it was definitely it's definitely the latter. So I would kind of peruse the the realtor.coms, the Zillows, and just again, one and a quarter rule, see if it made sense, see if it was a price point that I could afford at the time. Sent over five or six properties to my realtor and said, Hey, can we do this do these six Saturday morning? I'm ready to make an offer and and we would, you know, we'd go uh view the properties and start firing offers. Nice. That's awesome. Yeah. Right on. Just the traditional way, just yeah, beating the pavement and picking yeah. up units. I love yeah. That. So how did your acquisitions fare this past year as the market started to get, you know, a little bit crazy, like 2021? Hot. Um, I guess when I say this past year, we're almost at the end of 2022 now. Things have slowed down. But during 2021, when things were super hot, were you still able to buy things with that same level of like casualness, I guess? Or Short answer is no. But uh, 2021 uh, was a was an interesting year where I, I took a pivot to the short-term rental space. So I put my first short-term rental, uh, and this just kind of tells you my personality. My, my goal in 2021 was to buy a short-term rental, and I had a short-term rental under contract in January 2nd. So one of those like, hey, let's just make this happen type of thing. Yeah. And it was because there was a, a great alignment. You know, I had an existing property manager that was willing to stay on. I was absorbing a decent amount of bookings for the 2021 season. And it just felt plug and play where it wasn't going to feel heavy to me to do. So we did that first thing in 2021, bought an off-market townhouse kind of near the airport, which I think we, we bought right, uh, good, good equity kind of going into the deal. I think that might have been it for the acquisitions in 2021. Okay. Now, 2022 was a, a very heavy year in terms of acquisitions where mm. we bought 35% of the existing portfolio that we own today this year. Oh, wow. Nice. Really turned it up. Okay. Okay. No, that's huge. So I guess what was your secret to that then? Like, I mean, obviously the market was still super hot for the beginning of the year. Was this like now you were just patient and as people started to realize that they weren't going to get as much for their properties anymore that you were started to capitalize on that? Did you have to have a bunch of money saved? Combination of both of those. So it was it was a combination of, again, the active income putting me in a position to, to buy. I actually raised a little bit of money from mm -hmm. from family. And I find this as a funny phrase, but I was making disrespectful offers to a lot of um, potential respectable people. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, we, we were able to put a few under contract that, again, I, even with the run up and maybe the change in the interest rate environment today are going to be kind of long term 
quality holds in the multifamily space. So we bought a 16-unit apartment building with, with a storage garage on premise. We got the other short-term rental under contract closing this uh, month, which we got $100,000 under asking price, which I, wow. I thought was awesome. Wow, that's great. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, a small fourplex earlier in the year. So it was a good year in terms of unit count and cash flow. Yeah. See, no, that, that's awesome. I mean, making disrespectful offers. I mean, I don't know. We're wholesalers. That's what we do all day. It's just the <laughs> can't get what you don't ask for. Yeah, that's what I always say. Yeah, you know, and mm-hmm. sometimes that's what you got to do. I mean, even the house that that Dan lives in right now, Dan lives in this really nice, like giant house. It's low key. It's low. It's key. not it's low, low key. key. It's this giant, <laughs> ridiculous house in like the best part of town that you get it. What did you get it for? Like a hundred thousand dollars under asking, Dan? I was one hundred fifty under their original ask. Yeah. Yeah. Which you bought like what 2019? Oh, it was 2020. You're yeah. right, March. Yeah, March 20. And you got it just because it had been sitting for like a little bit, and because we've been we've been starting this business. Yes, we were used to making low offers, and you just shot your shot. And they were like, "Well, we like need a guaranteed sale because we're leaving the country." So sure, and they just accepted it. And then they were so grateful to have the house sold that they got you like gift baskets and like got your kids toys and stuff. Wow. (laughs) They did. They left all of their furniture, (laughs) all of their furniture. Little nice. Yeah. Yeah. I still have it in my house. (laughs) Wow. Love that. (laughs) Yeah. No. Well, the, the context though, I was doing that that year. Like I'll just shoot a low ball offer. I got one that people were so mad. They refused to respond. And I was like, hey, your house isn't worth what you want anyways. So like, why not shoot shoot my shot? And then, yeah, you know, sometimes they land, sometimes they don't. Yeah. Well, you guys both know in this business, it's like one deal like that makes a big difference. So you just yeah, right. fire from the hip and try to right. knock down a deal or two. And if you pick up 50, 100 grand in a deal, it's, it's, a, it's a great win. Yeah. I mean, and, and that can literally change the whole trajectory of your investing. Right. And that's what, you know, so we have, we have a mastermind, um, instant investor program where we have a lot of people that come in and they want to find off market properties. And it's always super challenging when you're starting out marketing and those sort of things, because it does take capital, you know, it takes time mm-hmm. and you're kind of in this grinding phase and, you know, whenever you start investing and really you kind of just need to keep grinding and keep shooting shots until you get that first big win. And that can literally change everything. Right. It's like, you've got to be at bat. You got to hit the base hits before you can start hitting home runs and base hits, keep your business running or keep you alive. And same thing with like, just even just buying your properties and adding them to your portfolio. You know, they're not all home runs, but man, when you do get that home run, it's like, hell yeah. All those like $200 a door cash flow units are great. And now I've got, you know, extra couple hundred grand in equity in this property plus $700 a month in cash flow. It's just like that home run. Exactly. You got to play to win. Yep combination of offense and defense you're, you're absolutely right yep so. yeah and it's, it's like that with everything in life too you know even going into like sports and stuff like that like there will be like i'm trying to think of like a random athlete i mean jeremy lynn do you guys remember him yeah he had like three good games when we were in college and but he's still like a talking point for, when he was for i think he played oh for like gosh. the rockets and he had like three good games like yeah. oh he's this asian guy from harvard who's good at basketball and then he was no longer good after that but he still like makes good money because he sells tickets and he's like a personality now you know, because he just went, decided that he was going to start shooting one game and it worked out for him. My analogy to that is, is Odell Beckham. Yeah, one catch yeah. that made his entire career. You know, right. Yeah, the just, yeah. single arm one. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there you go. In a New York stadium where he had, you know, 60,000 fans on primetime television. Yeah. He's, that's the guy. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, exactly. No, that that's cool though. So I guess as you're, you're looking at growing your portfolio, you're also taking a hybrid approach since you are a wealth manager. So you're putting money in securities. How exactly do you balance that? Because I think that's something, I mean, I know I personally, I'm not good at that. I tend to put all my money into real estate, but I do recognize the value of putting money into, you know, other assets like stocks and those sort of things. So I guess, how do you balance that and make those sort of decisions, know how much to put into real estate versus that? And like, what would you give advice for other people on that? Yeah, so here's here's my advice. And it came with... I've been in this business for almost 10 years. And the one thing I notice overwhelmingly obvious on a lot of my wealthiest clients' balance sheets is they had real estate. They had a big piece of real estate, but they also had marketable securities and liquidity. And it made it really, really easy for banks, lenders to lend the money because they weren't over leveraged. And so one of my goals has always been to uh, continue maintaining liquidity and, and not be the typical you know, real estate guy with, you know, 98% of his net worth in debt structured assets. 
And so I, yeah, on paper. Yep. 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 And, you know, part of that is me, is me maybe playing small and maybe playing Mm -hmm. uh, a little safer than I need to. But at the same time, I think, uh, you know, I'm easy to lend to. I show them my W2. I show them my cash reserves. I show them my, you know, my marketables. And that, that typically gets a lot of folks maybe comfortable with a hairy deal. Mm -hmm. And so if, if something, you know, it didn't feel right to the lender. I had some contingencies that got them comfortable. Yeah, right. And so what you're saying is liquidity on your balance sheet when you are going to your lender matters. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. It makes yeah. you more lend- more lendable. And of course, they love W-2 income. That's also a huge win uh, when you're getting financing because that's, that's key. A lot of folks kind of overlook that on what does your actual balance sheet look like because it's it's actually you know it's not that hard if you if you can get unlimited leverage to grow your your net worth um, like you said through leverage on your balance sheet, but that doesn't actually always correlate to cash flow or liquid cash flow. Like if one bad thing happens mm-hmm. and you all of a sudden can't cover it, and they want to know the bank wants to know like what else can we take from you really easily? Marketable securities and cash. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's not it's not even the bank being one hundred percent comfortable with it too. It's it's me being comfortable with it. Mm-hmm. You know. I have all the all my spreadsheets, right? And my portfolio says it makes this much money every month, but somehow that much money doesn't hit my bank account every month because stuff just happens, right? And uh, yep. you know, I, I did two roofs this year, two furnaces this year, to, you know, driveway, and it's really easy for a lot of your cash flow to be absorbed in these projects. And so when your cash flow is absorbed from your capex. And you plan for that, right? And you do all that, but it's nice to know that you have kind of some some cushion aside. Yeah, yeah. And I always like to preach like pro forma is not reality. And it's all good if you've had a stabilized portfolio for several years and your CapEx set-asides are filling up your reserves to where it doesn't even hit your cash flow anymore. But as you're growing and always adding units, it's really hard to keep that cash reserve built up because especially if you're stabilizing units at the same time, like when you buy it and you need, and you're burning it, you need to pay for that renovation and, and you sometimes don't get to burn it all out. And there's all sorts of things. And so again, pro forma is not reality. So it's a, it's a tough challenge as you're growing your portfolio. Yeah. Yeah, it really is. And, yeah. and I, I think there's a lot to be said there too. So like, I mean, even talking about like liquidity and being more lendable, I mean, the hardest house that was, I guess the, the transaction that was difficult for me over the past year was for me to buy my new primary even though we had literally, when, when we bought it, like I think just that up to that point in the year, we'd bought like 30 houses. And you know, and I had a portfolio <laughs> oh, wow. at that point of like 30 something units. And the lenders were just like, well, you know, your debt to income is this, I didn't have a W2. You know, I didn't have a huge amount of cash that wasn't tied directly to my business. We had several properties that were like under rehab, but still had mortgages. And getting this house, I actually had the first lender like a week before closing back out and be like, yeah, sorry, your debt to income isn't sufficient. So we can't close. And I was like, that's ridiculous. You know, we actually had to extend the closing 30 days. Fortunately, it was a new build and the the builder was willing to work with us for that because we gave him some concessions and start an entire new lending process with somebody that kind of like understood real estate investors a little bit better. And it was outrageous. And that's a big thing. Yeah, you got to have a loan officer that understands like Schedule E and K-1s and mm-hmm. you know how mm-hmm. depreciation works. That's that's a huge point you just made there. Yeah, so much because I, yeah, I, depreciation is special. And that's just a good, that's a token of knowledge right there is making sure your loan officer is adding back because that's actually what you're supposed to do. And sometimes they don't, mm-hmm. they do not add back the depreciation. And so it looks like you're poor. It looks like you're making no money, yeah. which yeah. is a great thing from a tax perspective. Yeah. Right, right especially when you're working with like the front person on your loan, right? Where they don't know, like they're the person that's like just the client relations. They're like probably making $45,000 a year to just like answer the phone and push paperwork. And the real decision maker, you know, which they keep that degree of separation for a reason. So there's no like, you know, bias that is established or any sort of like relationship with the borrower, right? To do that, to keep them neutral. But if the information doesn't get relayed correctly to the decision maker, it's going to screw up your whole deal. And like, you can't rely on the person that you're actually talking to going through that loan process to know those specific details, especially in times like last year, where there was like, I mean, loan officers and mortgage companies were like real estate, you know, realtors, like everyone was like quitting their job to go and like sell loans, Mm -hmm. you know, because that was an easy way to start making money during the boom. And now they're all gone. 
<laughs> so, yeah. yeah, funny how that works. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. So that so that's awesome. So I guess as you're you know continuing to go forward here, what are your plans and strategies and to keep on growing? Yeah, the the biggest goal is to be fully integrated with management companies by the end of probably next year for all my properties. And that's something that I totally missed the boat on. I'll be honest, guys, like I should have did that from day one, just uh, be more strategic and more high level in the decision making as opposed to trying to be in the weeds and cut costs in areas where it didn't make sense. And, you know, I, I found the right partners. So I have, you know, I have kind of two pockets in my portfolio in two different counties here. And uh, I've hired managers in both. And uh, it's just freed up allowed me to grow my active income, allowed me to be more strategic and maybe spend more time networking with with realtors, with brokers, with wholesalers, with, you know, you name it and work kind of on the business, not in the business, you know, and that's, that's been a big fix for me. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Yeah. That's, that's awesome. If you can figure out that secret, that's huge, especially with the managers. That's been our biggest struggle with our, our portfolio. We have what, 48 units to two of us and we've brought we have a couple different property managers just because a couple different geographic areas and man it is so difficult yeah. like as as recently as that i had a couple of properties of mine that i couldn't rent out well i guess the property manager could rent them out for like two months and i was like what is going on here so i went and like went to the house on a saturday took a bunch of photos put them up on zillow myself and had them rented and paid literally by monday and i was like okay this yeah. is unacceptable. It's not that bad. It's not that. It shouldn't be that hard. <laughs> no. Do you have, Brad, any like tips when you're looking and vetting out your property managers? So definitely finding somebody that's like pro scaling, right? So mm-hmm. I'd rather have somebody be investor minded than like charge one percentage point less. You know, like yeah. I, I just want my philosophy is never, you know, step over dollars, pick up pennies. And Right. You know, there's a lot of people in this industry that try to find the guy who charges 6% as opposed to 10%. And, yep. you know, they, they charge 150 bucks every time they go, you know, answer a service call. They don't pick up their phone on Wednesday at three o'clock. Like it's communications huge, right? So mm-hmm. uh, I just want to know what's going on with the properties, what their strategy is. Send me a monthly report and then let me be on with my life. Mm-hmm. You know, I think I found that in, in both my markets. Nice. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. And if you, you made a good point, like looking for the cheapest property manager, you know, real estate investors kind of have personas to known to be cheap people and cheap is never, ever the right way to go with your property manager, with your contractors, anything. They're, it just doesn't ever work out. I'm trying realtor. to be cheap. It never with your realtor. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Nothing works out when you go cheap. Yeah. yeah. My, that was one of my favorite things about last year was all these people that didn't understand that, you know, sure they could go and list like a 1% realtor because it would, you know, save them X amount. It's like, but then you like look and you're like, did they like take these photos with a baked potato? Like, have they, did they actually yeah. know what a house looks like? Because it would just be so bad. Yeah. And they'd be like, no one wants to buy my house, even in this market. Right. It's like, well, yeah. kind of messed up. Yeah. And that, that being said, though, you also have to work for your money. Yeah. So there's people jumping into the game as loan officers and real estate agents, and they didn't have to work for it. They just had endless leads. And now you have to work for it. And those ones that worked their butt off for the and, and were charging full commissions on whatever they're, they were selling are the ones that are going to continue to operate. Yeah, exactly. The market always disciplines, you know, the folks that are unprepared to do the work. Mm-hmm. So it's that's so great. We're going to come into this market in the next six months where all those realtors and mortgage officers that were ignoring investors because we're paying the ass, you know, they're, they're going to be calling us now. Yeah. It's going to be a market shift. Yeah. When the, you know, we I had a, I had a guy actually asked me something uh, recently. He texted me, said something about, you know, how's business or whatever. And I was like, Oh man, I still have hungry buyers out there. And he's like, really? Well, what do you mean that you have hungry buyers? And I said, well, you know, flippers still got to flip. If you're a flipper, you're going to flip. And if you're an investor, you're going to buy things. You, it just has, has to be a good deal, just like any other time in the market. If it makes sense for you yesterday, it might make sense for you today, just at different pricing. And so there's still hungry people out there. And those are the ones that are going to consistently buy and help those agents and loan officers you just talked about. Yep, 100%. Exactly. And with real estate, the people that are wealthiest and have the largest portfolios, I think the number one thing they're going to universally all have in common is they just never stop buying you know, up market, mm-hmm. down market, whatever. They just kept going. Sure, things get weird for a little bit. Sure, they have to adjust their buying criteria. But it's a long game. You know, it's consistency over time. And sure, you can, every now and then, you can have like a crazy market that allows you to get 
been a little bit lucky and, you know, maybe make some, some money quick, but really, if you want to be true wealth, you know, you want to be like the guy that's 80 years old, that's worth a hundred million dollars, you know, cause of all your real estate, like that's going to take a long time to build. It's going to require a lot of consistency. You gotta, you just have to adjust your, just have to adjust your criteria. I was at 4am this morning feeding my son and, uh, got down this weird rabbit hole. And, uh, I was looking at the Fred graphs on my cell phone while I'm holding the bottle and all that. And the, you know, they say you should have 30% of your income go towards housing like that. If you go above 30%, you start getting into where you're cash strapped or you're financially unstable. And so I was like, well, if that's the case, well, then if you look at the average household income across or the median household income of like $71,000 across the entire nation, that's that right in the middle, 50% below that and 50% people make above that. You look at that, they can generally afford max of $1,725 a month. And so if you just look at principal and interest between last year's rates and today's rates, that's a $400,000 house down to a $260,000 mm-hmm. house, not including taxes or insurance. Yeah. That's crazy. Wow. So now you're buying, that's your buying criteria now. Mm-hmm. If it was yep. a $400,000 house last year, go buy, go buy it for 260. Yeah. Yep. Sorry. <laughs> that's the truth. Yeah, right. <laughs> so yeah, no, that's awesome. Right on Brad. Well, um, as we start to get to the end here, we'd love to go into our, our guest questions that we always ask. So first off the crowd favorite question, what is your craziest real estate investing story? My first ever rental, my small condo I rented to my first tenant. Ten months later, I was given my first uh, suit. So she tried suing me for not returning a whole uh, security deposit. So, (laughs) you know, and it was some, I mean, I ended up settling it within 10 days or whatever. But it's just, this is what every rental is going to be. You know, my head starts spinning. Like, do I really want to do this? You know, you start getting worried because I don't, you know, I didn't have any real money then and so that that was the wild one <laughs> yeah so so she sued you for not giving all the deposit back so what, you didn't give her yeah. back like 75 dollars, and she <laughs> <laughs> yeah it, it, the, the suit was over like literally 500 bucks oh yeah. my god it probably cost almost that just to file it with the county or whatever <laughs> yeah. i think she had a family Jeez. member that was an attorney i don't know but oh my god yeah yeah i'm gonna get you yeah. with tenant laws in ohio are those things typically i guess is it favorable towards tenants there or more towards landlords you know the one thing i'll say that is really good is we don't have rent control here mm-hmm. uh mm-hmm. which which i think is a, a good a good pro but i mean we have a lot of um I guess section eight or subsidized housing here that is, is very um, tenant friendly, but it's in a market where it has a price point. We have a lot of investors. So, I mean, I I'd say it's pretty 50, 50 across the board. Gotcha. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. Cause, okay. cause Washington where we are is very pro tenant, which I mean, if you go through the process and you go by the books really isn't that bad to be completely honest. We've had to evict a couple of people. I mean, it's terrible when you compare it to places like Texas, Yeah, Texas, where you just like, you know, you, you, <laughs> oh, can, yeah. you can send in like your, your drywall or who's freaking stacked to go and throw them out. But you know, you can't, can't do <laughs> that, here. that way. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but like, you know, here, what the, one of the problems is they have like a tenants union that is, you know, part of the the whole government organization, right? And they will actually, so like that situation, if they wanted to take a landlord to court and they had to uh, cause to do that, like they will actually have it paid for. And then the landlord will have to, yeah, by the state. And the landlord will actually have to come out of pocket for their side of it. So like people have incentive just to pursue everything that they can. The only plus side is that, the the Washington Tenant Union website and rules and regulations are so freaking confusing that they make yeah. it so hard for people to figure out. <laughs> they don't know if you're in the right or wrong as a landlord. I've gone there trying to yeah. find answers for myself, and I'm like, God, I, I should know it, this. Well, it's hard for landlords, but it's also hard for tenants. So yeah, I like, oh, totally. I, yeah. at least that's the equal playing field is you have to be highly committed, you know, and even the most dirtbag of person, like they'll eventually just be like, I don't know, man, this seems like a waste of time for 500 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, well, I'm um, sure awesome. as, as the unit count increases, I'll probably spend more money and time into screening. But, you know, unless you're a total, you know, piece of shit, most people can have a good job, pay their rent, move on, you know, and 
it'd be okay. It's for not him. that hard to find them. It yeah. really isn't. I don't know how so many landlords find all the shitty tenants, but I've never had a problem finding a good tenant. It's because yeah. they have shitty properties, so it attracts them and they don't verify. I mean, like the only, the only bad tenants we've had are ones that we inherited with properties that we bought. Yep. Yep. Totally. So, yep. 100%. Cool. All right. So next question, what is one piece of advice you would give either for a new investor looking to get started or a small investor looking to take their investment to the next level? For the one getting started, just do do one deal. Just do it. Just doesn't have to be, you know, the great white buffalo deal. Just do a deal. Just just do one and get it under your belt. Learn the systems. Learn for that first year what it feels like owning real estate. And then consistently try to talk with people that are like that next base ahead of you, that next step ahead of you. Because the reality is a lot of real estate people like talking about real estate and mm-hmm. they're okay to share their information. It's not a zero sum game. Everyone can win. Everyone can own. And that's talk to mentors. There you go. Perfect. I love it. I like Super it. sound pieces of advice. And last question, where can people find you and follow along if they feel so inclined or uh, where can people contact you if you want anyone to do that? Yeah. Instagram's probably easiest. It's Brad, Brad Dumas at Brad Dumas. And then, Email at Bradley Dumas, B R A D L E Y D U M A S at iCloud.com. Perfect. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, guys, for listening. Um, and thanks so much, Brad, for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. If you guys enjoyed this podcast, please go and leave us a five star review wherever you listen to your podcast and share it with someone who also might be starting to grow a portfolio um, or could relate to Brad. And uh, feel free to reach out to Brad too. He is doing things, and I think a very I would say smart way and structured way that, you know, sure he might be, might be, he said, as he said in his own words, a little bit lazy. He's going like a little bit slow, but I also guarantee that he's definitely not going to get bit like some of us that are going balls to the wall. (laughs) It's not fancy. Yep. Just doing what you're supposed to one foot in front of the other, right? Consistency does help. Exactly. All about that consistency. So awesome. So thanks so much for listening guys. And we'll talk to you guys next week. Yeah. Thanks guys. Thanks for listening, everybody. Please leave us a five-star review wherever you listen to your podcast. For the people that go and leave us a five-star review up until we have 50 reviews, if you take a screenshot and you send it to me on Instagram at Mike underscore invest, I will send you a free Collecting Keys podcast t-shirt. They're rad shirts. They're tri-blend. They're super nice. So definitely do that. And I would love to send you a shirt. Aside from that, if you want to start getting off-market leads and buying discounted properties just like Dan and I do every single month, go to collectingkeyspodcast.com slash free and you can get our free five-step guide to start generating off-market leads and you can get started right away. It's not a crazy difficult process. You just kind of need a system and then you would be off to the races. Aside from that, guys, thanks so much for listening and uh, talk to you guys next week. Thanks for listening. Please leave us a review on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. And check us out at collectingkeyspodcast.com for tips and guides on starting your own real estate investment and wholesaling business.